All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our author talk with uh, Tanya Blanchard, uh, who has uh, recently released her newest uh, book, The Echoes of War. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the various lands we're on to meet online, um, in particular the Darawal country, uh, whose lands Wollongong City Libraries are on, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so Tanya writes historical fiction inspired by her family history. Uh, she grew up listening to her grandparents' fascinating tales of life during World War II and migrating to Australia. Uh, and coming from a family with a rich cultural heritage, stories have always been in her blood. Uh, her first novel, The Girl from Munich, was a runaway bestseller and uh, shortlisted for the ABIA Best New Writer Award. Uh, Tanya lives in Sydney now with her husband and three children, where she can often be found in the kitchen cooking up a storm for her family, uh, including her two cheeky dogs who think that they're human too. Uh, so Tanya, Without further ado, uh, I'll let you take it away and tell us about the Echoes of War. Oh, thanks so much, Mitchell, for having me. And um, thanks to Wollongong Li Library for this wonderful opportunity to chat about Echoes of War. Um, hello, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do is actually give you a little bit of a presentation and talk about the inspiration behind Echoes of War. Um, I've also got a little bit of a slideshow going on here too. So just bear with me for one second and I will just pop that up so that you can see it. Um, here we go. Oh, I think I might need to go back. Here we are. All right. Um, so this is Echoes of War, um, my latest book, which was um, released uh, at the end of September this year. And I'd like to tell you about the inspiration behind the story and share with you some of the fascinating things I learned while researching and writing this story, which is inspired by my father's family stories. So I have to say that I love the cover with its Mediterranean feel and it, the, the colours really pop and you can really tell it's a story set around the Mediterranean area. Um, and, and Echoes of War is a really interesting title for this novel set in the south of Italy with all the evocative titles um, to match that gorgeous imagery of the Mediterranean. But we decided on Echoes of War because it speaks of the insidious threat and build-up of the war and how all the wars Italy was involved with in, in the 1930s, um, and there were a few which I hadn't realised, um, lead up and including World War II, they really all touched the lives of those who lived in the remote region of southern Calabria until war arrived on their very doorstep. So this novel is written from the Italian perspective on war, especially during Mussolini's fascist regime and Italy's unique position with World War II. And so the story starts in 1936, and I'll just, before we go any further, I love this slide. This is just a lovely um, image of all the different um, things that are involved in Echoes of War, the different uh, parts of the story and the images. It gives you a real sense of um, Italy during the 1940s. So the story starts in 1936 with fascist Italy already at war with Abyssinia, which is modern day Ethiopia. So as Mussolini drives forward with his dream of colonial expansion and creation of a second Roman Empire to make Italy great again, so it could stand tall amongst the powerful nations of Europe. So we first see Giulia, a spirited young woman in a monastery deep in the mountains of southern Calabria, after her brother Vincenzo has just left for war in Abyssinia. They've grown up in a remote farming village right on the tip of the toe of Italy, where the traditional lifestyle continues on as it has done for centuries. Giulia loves her family, but struggles against her strict traditional upbringing, especially butting heads with her father, Andrea. She wants to become a healer like her nonna and live a big life, not the life expected of her within the village. But it's a tumultuous time in Italian history and war touches even the remote villages as the young men of Calabria are called to fight first in Abyssinia, then the Spanish Civil War, Albania, and then when Italy joins World War II in 1940. The women are left to run the farms and businesses to make sure life in the village continues as it always has. They've always known that they're strong and resilient, but it's their unity that makes them stronger. And this is something Julia learns as she supports her mother and grandmother as best she can. 
The war draws steadily closer until finally war arrives on Italian soil in 1943 with the Allied invasion and Italy is embroiled in a bloody and brutal civil war between the fascist North and the occupied Allied South. Julia is conflicted between her duty to her family and her desire to forge her own path until she can no longer remain a passive bystander. She knows she can make a difference to the lives of Italians affected by the war. So at a time of great upheaval with men trying to pull the world apart, this is one woman's story of determination to find a life's work, her place in the world she lives in, and the passion of a deep and abiding love. Now, this is a photo of my grandfather. So my journey to writing Echoes of War actually began quite unexpectedly. A few years ago, while visiting my father, I noticed an old black and white photo that I'd never seen before on his fridge. And this is the photo you're looking at on your screen now. The picture was of a young man in military uniform. He looked so much like my father, it was uncanny, and I knew it had to be my grandfather. But I couldn't understand why he was in military uniform, as I'd been told that he was exempt from serving during World War II. My father confirmed that the photo was of his father and told me that my grandfather had fought with the Royal Italian Army in the Italian wars with Abyssinia, modern day Ethiopia, and Albania prior to World War II. I'd never imagined that my nonno, a quiet and reserved man, had done anything quite as exotic as going to Africa or had fought in any wars prior to World War II. So it really sparked my imagination and I was intrigued. I began to wonder what his life as a young man had been like. How leaving his small village and the farm he ran in the very south of Italy to fight in foreign countries may have changed his perspective of the world. My love of family stories has been with me since I can remember. On my mother's side, I had the big stories from my German grandmother and her meticulously kept documentation, photos and mementos. These resulted in The Girl from Munich, Suitcase of Dreams and Letters from Berlin. But on my father's side, I have only a few photos and the small snippets of stories which explain what life must have been like in Italy around the war years. Sadly, both my grandparents passed away before I was old enough to think to ask them about their lives. My father's older siblings, who would have remembered so much more, have also passed away. All I could do was talk to my father and his sister about the stories they had heard. The snippets of stories come from them but also from my memories of stories my uncle told when I was young and in the memories of my grandparents. So you can see the picture there on the left is obviously my nonno, my grandfather, and nonna is on the right. And these photos were taken when they uh, were here in Australia, probably in the 50s or 60s. So they were just getting established already um, back, back then. Um, and you can see they've got a lot of strength of character about them. I think they've been quite through quite a lot to, um, to come to Australia and migrate and get settled. So my nonno was a wonderful cheesemaker, a skill he perfected while on the farm in Italy, and he always made the best ricotta. He and nonna kept a market garden on their 10 acres on the outskirts of Sydney, and they sold vegetables at the markets and also on the side of the road. Well, my grandfather actually came to Australia in 1951, followed by my two oldest uncles. I knew my nonna remained in Italy for a few years with her four youngest children managing the farm until my grandfather had saved enough money for them to join him in Australia. And they came out sometime around 1954. I always wondered how she'd managed on her own, what a strong and resourceful woman she must have been. My childhood memories of her are sadly few, but I remember her being the heart of the family, the one who brought everyone together. My aunt told me stories about her mother regularly traveling across Sydney to see her when she was newly married, using two buses and two trains without any English. I admired her courage even more when I learned that Nonna, although very intelligent, had had limited schooling and was illiterate. And like Julia in the story, I always wonder what she might have done if she'd had the opportunity to study further. Well, 
My father told me that people often to, came to see my grandmother to seek help for minor ailments, babies with colic, adults with headaches, I mean, among many other things. She used old folk remedies and herbs and performed cupping to help with respiratory complaints. This technique involved placing a candle or flame of some sort under a glass to create suction and where it was then placed on the afflicted person's back. Somehow, all this didn't surprise me, and I wondered if in the recesses of my childhood memories, I'd seen her tend to people who needed her help. I used to play a game with my sister and younger cousins when we were at our grandparents' place, where we had to gather herbs from the wilds around us, weeds and grasses, to treat pretend injuries and to cook for our dinner. Though many years later, this crystallised into a love for herbal medicine, and already a physiotherapist, I completed my herbal medicine diploma. This was all, of course, the inspiration for Julia's and Nonna Mariana's characters. I love this picture too. Again, we've got snippets of the different pieces of the story of Echoes of War and that real sense of the 1930s and 40s. Though after talking to my father and my aunt about the family stories they remember, I was pleased to be able to weave them through the fabric of the novel as I tried to paint a picture of what life might have been like for the people in the remote villages of southern Calabria in the 1930s and 40s, just like my grandparents. My father remembers his mother telling him how afraid she was when the Allied planes flew overhead from Malta in the air raids on the southern cities uh, in, the, in 1940, 1943, even though they were so remote and nowhere near any military or strategic targets. And I was also amazed when she told him how German soldiers came through their village just the once, lost and desperate for food, again in 1943. Another family story was about a little boy who had terrible burns on his back after an accident with boiling water on the stove. His older sister was looking after him while their mother was out and he pulled the water off the stove and all over his back. Uh, she put ink on his burns before the doctor arrived and I was really fascinated to learn more about why they put ink on his back. I heard also how his mother had been so afraid after the Allies invaded that she'd developed mastitis and lost all her milk, giving her newborn to the other nursing women in the village to breastfeed until he was weaned. And I heard stories too that for years after, women from the village would come up to him and just poke his little cheeks and say, we remember you, we breastfed you when you were a baby. So that would be pretty weird. But <laughs> it's amazing how these story, stories just perpetuate and, and, and also the connection of the community as well. Um, okay. And again, I, I love these uh, little pieces of the story. So we've got the boys at war, we've got the, the strong women of the community and we have Julia there on the, on the right finding her way in the world. So once I had my main character of Julia, it was time to learn about the characters around her. Of course, first was her family, the most important cornerstone of Italian and Calabrian culture. One of my aunts I learned always had love of the farm and wanted to be, create her livelihood from the farm, just like Julia's sister Paola in the story. Uh, I learned from my father and aunt that another aunt was actually a fabulous dressmaker like Teresa, Julia's oldest sister. And many of the first names I've used are in fact family names. My oldest uncle's name was Santoro, although we called him Santo, and he was a school teacher in Bruzzano, having studied at Teachers College in Reggio. I had to weave him and his love of history into the story as Santoro, Teresa's husband and the schoolmaster. I remember as a child listening to my uncle's stories of ancient history and of the Philistines who he joked with me, trying to confuse me with my teacher called Sister Philippine. He loved sharing his knowledge with others and I had to put this passion and yearning for learning and the desire to help others into Julia's and Stefano's characters. Julia's brothers in the story, Vincenzo and his friends Angelo and Stefano are based on my grandfather and his time as a soldier in the Italian army. Julia's father, Andrea, is also a master cheesemaker and farmer, just like my grandfather was. And lastly, Julia's aunt, Zia Francesca, who owns the Trattoria, which is like a small restaurant, and always has her back, is inspired by my own aunt, who's an amazing cook and has always been there to support me, as well as my great aunt, who I met in Bruzzano, whose name was Zia Francesca. 
I love that I've been able to honour my family through the small touches in my story and that I could use my own memories of the village where my father's family came from. I was fortunate to spend a few weeks in Brutsana with, with my family when I was a teenager. It's a village that hasn't changed too much since the war years or probably for hundreds of years in some respects. I've been able to draw on those memories to make my story more authentic. I remember my great aunt, Z Francesca, still using the old kitchen with the open fire and pots hung over the flames and embers, even though she had a modern kitchen in the next room. I remember some of the older houses with dirt floors and was amazed that people lived without flooring. But my favourite memory was walking through the village of an evening, the Passagata, when locals sat outside their homes and chatted to those walking through the streets. The village came alive of an evening. There was a real lively energy and a sense of community. Usually we were walking back to my aunt's from the local pizzeria that her daughter ran, eating gelato. Pizza and gelato, a match made in heaven. I still have wonderful memories of that time. The fabulous food, learning the language, and the sense of lightness from the unhurried rhythm the life of life that the locals lived. I plan to visit southern Italy last year. I hope to touch base with family members, get more of a feel for the family stories, as well as more information, and to find the places that really touched my soul, places I knew that I had to write about. Sadly, of course, COVID hit and all my plans went out the window. But I was lucky enough to turn to my father and aunt who had been the previous year, and it was their stories of the people, places and food, as well as the gorgeous photos that gave me the initial start for my story. And on your screen here, you should be able to see my aunt's photos of Bruzzano. So this is the town that they were born in and that my father's family came from. And what I love about these photos, you can see the mountains in the background and you can see it was quite uh, arid and rugged. This was taken in summertime, obviously. Um, obviously, the town has grown quite a bit since the 1940s, but you still get that sense of that, that wildness and, and that ruggedness, I suppose, of the countryside. Um, okay. Oops. Okay. But one of the greatest joys of looking into my father's family story has been reconnecting with family members and family friends who I haven't seen in some time. They all added to the rich fabric of my family with their own stories of life in Calabria and Calabrian culture and traditions. I was lucky enough to sample their cooking and even learned how to make salami. And you can see in this uh, slide here all the wonderful foods I was able to, to try. So my aunt's wonderful gnocchi, I reckon it's the best gnocchi in Sydney, if not Australia. Um, and then we had the biscotti, which was just below it, which is my grandmother's recipe. In the middle, we have these beautiful meatballs and, of course, the homemade bread. So this bread here has actually got olives through it. And on the right-hand side, of course, you can see the salami. So um, that's it hanging as it cures because it needs to cure for some time before you can actually eat it. And it was quite tricky to learn how to actually tie the knots on the sections of the salami after it had been put into the casing. And down the bottom here we have um, zippoli, which are fried Italian donuts, which um, I remembered growing up with and I, I tried to make them myself. So all of this wonderful family food and um, culture reminded me of the days of when I was a child, when all the aunts would gather together in the backyard to make tomato sauce from fresh tomatoes. And I swear it's still the best sauce to use for pasta dishes. And it also brought back memories of my nonna cooking for hours on a Sunday when all the family came together. The food was always plentiful, aunts gathering around the stove, and I remember the mouth watering pasta dishes, the fried zippoli, um, both sardine and plain, uh, crustily dusted with icing sugar that disappeared as quickly as they were fried, and of course the fresh homemade bread. It was a delight for the senses as much as it was a feast for the stomach. My nonna's ricotta and fresh honey straight from the honeycomb was better than any dessert though. I've been lucky enough to try my hand at my grandmother's biscotti recipe and make zippoli just like I remembered as a child. And I had to use this love of food using fresh seasonal ingredients that's so important to Calabrians in Echoes of War. Cooking is a way of showing love and family gathered around the table is the ultimate symbol of love and devotion. And there are so many scenes set in the, in the novel around the table 
um, of people being together and family connecting. But when it came to further research, I never imagined how complex Italy's war really was and how the country was torn in two as a result. And I realised I knew even less about Calabria's role in this war. I did lots of research, reading books by historians, first-hand accounts by soldiers during World War II, and lots of articles. I learnt more about Mussolini and his fascist reign, or, or the role of the Vatican and the relationship between the Catholic Church, Mussolini and the Italian people. Of course, I also learnt more about the wars that it Italy was engaged in, especially World War II, and particularly the battles on Italian soil, and then also how the war was perceived by Italians. So I was fascinated to learn how the isolation geographically and politically from Rome and the wealthy industrial north affected southern attitudes to war and led to oppression and exploitation of the region. And I was also amazed to learn about the peasant revolts and the formation of short-lived independent southern Italian and Sicilian communities, especially towards the end of World War II. The South had resisted the idea of unification and never truly felt part of the Kingdom of Italy ever since its declaration in 1861. It was interesting to realise that a united Italy had had such a tumultuous history and was only 80 years old when World War II broke out. And just before we move on from this slide, you can probably see uh, Calabria is the green toe um, and foot, I suppose, right down the bottom of Italy on the peninsula, and Sicily is the, the soccer ball, I suppose, next to it. Um, so you can see it's right down the bottom of Italy. Um, Italy is a really long peninsula. Rome is kind of about halfway up. So in fact, um, Calabria was really quite isolated from the power center of Italy, which was Rome. And then of course, the Northern states where all the industry was happening as well. And so that was interesting to explore that to set um, the story of Echoes of War. While watching a documentary about experts trying to predict when Mount Vesuvius will blow again, I was intrigued by the geothermal activity that still surrounds Naples and Pompeii to this day, and decided to look into any interesting geology further south in Calabria. I was fascinated to learn how much Calabria was affected by its geology. Surrounded by a major fault line and within close proximity of two active volcanoes, it's a region that lives with the constant threat of earthquakes. The largest and most well known are the earthquakes of 1905 and 1908, measuring 7.9 on the Richter scale. The 1908 quake triggered a tsunami that destroyed much of the coast of Calabria and Sicily, damaging the cities of Reggio and Messina. Over 11,000 deaths, deaths were reported across Calabria. And I really wanted to use this constant uncertainty and the incredible resilience of the Calabrian people in the story. And I, so I fashioned the earthquake and tidal wave in the novel after this historic event. I also discovered that there are hot springs in the ancient hamlet of Monticello, near Bruzzano, and I understood then why so many Calabrians here in Australia love the hot springs as a form of healing, recovery and relaxation, as it was probably a part of their lifestyle in Calabria, where there are many hot springs in the region with the geothermal activity. So, of course, the hot springs have also made it into the story. And on the slides here, before I continue, you can see on the left is the tiny, um, the tiny little hamlet of, of Multicella. So it's deep into the mountains. Um, it's quite, quite isolated. And on the right hand side, of course, you can see the devastating um, chaos and, and destruction of, of the earthquake of 1908. So I also read about the terrible floods of 1951 and 1953, and floods were another common occurrence in Southern Italy. Um, both, both actually destroyed ancient villages and began a new wave of migration to Northern Italy and overseas countries, such as Australia, the United States and Canada. In the aftermath of war, Calabrians who had already suffered so much had to endure this tragedy after periods of long drought and poor economic recovery. So this really symbolised to me the incredible resilience of the Calabrian people, and I really wanted to include the 1951 floods in Echoes of War. But what I found particularly intriguing was learning about Calabrian history. 
I've loved exploring and researching the connection between family, religion, medicine, healing, and the ancient Greek and Byzantine roots of this part of the world that have been preserved for centuries. Calabria first experienced human habitation in the Stone Age and has a long history of settlement by the great civilizations of ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the Byzantines, Normans, and even the Ottomans. This land was once called Magna Graecia and was settled in the 8th century BC by the ancient Greeks. Many of the Calabrian traditions can be traced back to these ancient Greek beginnings. And there are still villages in southern Calabria who speak Greco, a form of ancient and medieval Greek. I love learning more about the traditions that have continued for hundreds of years in Calabria, the ancient craftsmanship that used in making traditional musical instruments like tambourines and bagpipes, the weaving of colourful Byzantine-like fabrics, the growing of silkworms and weaving of silk and the delicate crocheting of lace. And here in this slide, you can see on the left-hand side, this is actually old Bruzzano. This is the original village of Bruzzano, which was further up into the mountains, and it was destroyed by the 1908 earthquake. On the right-hand side here, this is you can see the mountains there, so this is really quite remote, this community, is an old Greco village. Uh, so this particular dialect of Greek is still spoken in this village and a lot of the Greek traditions are, are still held by, by people that live in this community. So really quite fascinating. Uh, I also love learning about the history of religious influences in the region and the blending of a number of religious traditions. Christianity with the more ancient worship of the Greek and Roman gods. Religious differences in the Christian church in the 11th century led to a split and resulted in Eastern and Western Christianity, the Byzantine Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic churches. Many Byzantine monasteries, Greek, Armenian and Albanian, sprang up through Calabria as monks and religious communities fled the growing Ottoman Empire in Eastern Europe from the 8th century. And I have the strong and feisty Julia spending time at an ancient Byzantine monastery in the rugged mountains of Calabria, learning herbal medicine and taking part in the annual festival dedicated to the Madonna. And you can see here in this slide uh, the different styles of churches, I suppose, the different architecture, um, which would also was the different uh, rituals and the different uh, types of, of religious practice. So on the left-hand side here, we can see the real Byzantine um, church uh, with the with the domes um, in on the on the towers, um, and here on the right hand side you can see the more modern um, cat or the more uh, Norman styled um, church, which was um, built a little bit later. Um, so there's the different styles of uh, churches in Calabria, all quite ancient um, in their own way. Um, so, as you can see on the right-hand side here, this, this is actually a monastery, um, a famous sanctuary of Our Lady of the Mountain in Pulsi. So, the, the uh, monastery that um, Julia goes to is actually based on this particular uh, monastery. So, it's an ancient Brazilian monastery deep in the Aspromonte Mountains in Calabria, which I later discovered my aunt had actually visited in 2019. Though so it was possibly founded in the 7th century, when Byzantine monks fled from the Saracen invasion across the Mediterranean. But legend has it that the Madonna appeared to a boy asking him to build a church dedicated to her, and a statue of the Madonna and the baby Jesus sits in pride of place, set in a niche decorated with golden stars behind the altar and flanked by two marble columns. And I'll just show you that slide now. So there that is there, and that's actually my aunt's photo of the altar and the Madonna um, when she went to visit in 2019. And as you can see, it's really ornate, um, quite beautiful, and um, it shows how much they revered the Madonna. And, and um, it was a time when uh, lots of ornate um, scenes on the wall and, and the use of gold and ornate and uh, rich kind of materials um, was really popular to show their reverence to God and the Madonna. Um, okay. 
So the Festival of the Madonna of the Mountain at Palsy um, is famous for drawing thousands of, of thousands of pilgrims every year around the summer months and has its roots in the ancient Greek fertility rites performed nearly 3,000 years ago in this same region. Many women still come to ask the Madonna for her favour in matters of fertility, childbirth and marriage, just as they did with the Greek goddesses of fertility, Persephone and Demetra in ancient times. And if you've just heard dogs barking in the background, um, we've got two dogs and our, our youngest dog has just been out to the groomers today and arrived home. So our very old Jack Russell has just heard her come home and is barking. So anyway, they will be a bit quiet now that they're being, being reunited. Um, in Julia's time in the 1930s, woman would, women would still dance along the mountain passes to be worthy of the Madonna's favour. And the Tarantella, an ancient and traditional Calabrian dance where the partners never touch, is still performed at festivals with the dancers often in elaborate traditional costume. Instruments such as the accordion, tambourine, bagpipes, flute and the Calabrian style mandolin play the distinctive rhythmic music which starts slow and rises in tempo as the two dancers in the centre of the circle dance and twirl faster. And I had to weave the distinctive tarantella that I remember my aunts and uncles dancing when I was a child into Echoes of War too. I was actually first intrigued by the festivals dedicated to the Madonna when my father told me about the local festival he and my aunt attended in Bruzzano when they were in Italy in 2019. He, he explained that every year a statue of the Madonna is taken in a procession from the church within the town to a tiny church dedicated to the Madonna of the Chain, situated on the road between Bruzzano and Ferrozzano. Everyone from the town goes, and there's music and dancing and great joy. It's here that a mass is performed and the festival takes place for three days early in September. It's odd for there to be a small church on its own between the two towns, and legend has it that some sailors from Bruzzano and Ferrozzano sometime in the Middle Ages found a chest on a nearby beach containing an alabaster statue of the Madonna and the baby Jesus with a little African boy chained at her feet. Here we go. <laughs> My pups just walked in. <laughs> Hello, Millie. <laughs> I can't quite. Come here. Yeah. Yeah, come up so everyone can see you, Millie. Hmm? Get her up. Oh, here we go. This this is Millie, everyone. And she's just had a groom and she's a very happy puppy to be home. <laughs> All right, Millie, off you go now. Um, so these sailors loaded the chest onto a cart pulled by oxen and when they reached the fork in the road between Bruzzano and Ferrozzano, the oxen refused to go any further. The sailors believed that this was where the Madonna wanted her church to be built, on the border between the two villages, which is where the church of the Madonna of the, chain was, of the Chain was actually built. The Madonna of the Chain, I discovered, is the Madonna who protects and rescues slaves and prisoners. Considering Calabria's long history of invasions, and with Bruzzano so close to the coast and the Ionian Sea, where marauders were attacking, I can see why this particular Madonna is of such significance. I remember a picture of this same Madonna on my nonna's bedroom wall when I was a child, but I could never understand why she was holding a little African boy in chains. Now, of course, it makes so much more sense. And I'm amazed to think that in this one single image, the rich culture and long history of Calabria is embodied so fully. So in this slide here, of course, you can see on the left-hand side is um, the, the church of the Madonna of the Chain. Um, and it's right, it is perched right in the middle between the two towns on the road um, that link the two towns and actually overlooks the ocean and the surrounding countryside. There's nothing else around it for miles. Um, and on the right hand side here, you can see um, this is my aunt's photo of the Madonna and child and the African boy in, in the church. Um, so, yes, this is the similar, similar image to um, the painting that was on my grandmother's wall. Okay. In the process of visiting this part of my heritage, 
I've been reminded how strong family ties are in determining who you are and the person you become. My love of family has come from my own background and I know I've only just scratched the surface of what Calabria and its people are all about. There's so much more to delve into, the wild landscapes, the vibrant and passionate people, the ancient and tumultuous history, a real mixing pot of cultures that has become quintessentially Calabresi. I've discovered that I'm drawn to this part of the world and I can't wait to one day return to Calabria to trace my family roots, to explore what makes me feel connected to this place and perhaps one day to bring further family stories to life. I'd like to actually finish off now with a reading based on the story my grandfather told about the Nazis coming into their village after the Allies had landed in 1943 and of his mother's terror. This scene shows the resilience and the strong bonds of the women left in the village during the war, working together for their survival and for the survival of their homes, their farms, their businesses, and of course, the village. Okay, and I might actually, while I'm here too, is just take you off um, the screen here so you can see me read. One morning, as I was collecting the yellow flowers of St John's Wort from the fields before breakfast, I heard a dog barking in the distance. Straightening up and stretching, I surveyed the landscape. Coming towards me along the road was a squad of about 10 soldiers. I squinted in the sunlight and felt sure they were not Italians. They weren't wearing the right uniform. I picked up my skirts and ran back into the village. Soldiers are coming, I yelled. I went to the church and banged on the door of the priest's residence. Padre! Soldiers are coming, I repeated through gasping breaths as he opened the door and stared at me in astonishment. They're just outside the village. Are they Italian? He asked. I shook my head. No, but I don't know if they're allies or Germans, he grunted. Either way, the people of this town won't view them kindly, he thought for a moment. I'll ring the bell. It's the only way to warn people in time. Knock on as many doors as you can and tell people to stay inside. With any luck, they'll, they're just passing through and won't trouble us at all. I nodded, dubious, but there was nothing else to do. I turned and began knocking on doors, encouraging others to help me warn the village as the bell started to toll. I made sure I warned Santoro and Teresa at the schoolmaster's house and Rosa at the general store before climbing a stone wall to see the soldiers progress. I could see helmets at the end of the street. May the Madonna protect us, I breathed and sprinted to Nunna's, but she was already outside her house. Come on, I said, pulling her by the arm. Let's go to Mama's. Soldiers are coming. We ran with the other villagers, some dragging pigs and sheep from their yards into their homes. I banged on Mama's door and she opened it immediately. Quickly, come inside, she said, slamming the door behind us and bolting it firmly. We rushed to the shuttered windows and peered outside as men in uniform milled about the street. They're German, whispered, whispered Nonna after we heard them speaking amongst themselves. They were thin, haggard and dirty, desperate men and not at all like the tall, proud Germans we'd heard about. But desperate men were the most dangerous of all. I remembered what Stefano had written about the Nazis in Sicily and I shuddered. What did they want here? They're our allies, said Paola. They might be, but I'm not letting them in here, said Mama. I hope Antonio is safe in the mountains. We watched as they knocked on doors, but nobody answered. Our knuckles white against the shutters as we waited to see what they would do. I don't think they mean to harm us, said Nonna. Otherwise they would have done it already. I'm not so sure, I whispered, more afraid now than I had been during the air raids. I just wish they'd go away, muttered, non, muttered Mama. The soldiers climbed over fences and walked into gardens, picking ripe tomatoes and anything else they could get their hands on. They broke branches as they roughly pulled fruit from the trees. The hide of them, said Paula. They're stealing all we have. That produce has to last for months. She started for the door and I pulled her back although I wanted more than anything to rush out and snatch the produce back. No, Paola, you can't go out there. We 
We don't know what they might do. They could attack us or shoot anyone who tries to stop them. It's not worth the risk. A squealing pig was dragged from its pen. The soldier jubilant at his find. I was appalled by the theft in broad daylight. But then I noticed how frail he was, his uniform hanging off him. And when I looked at the others on the street, I wondered how long they'd eaten the how long since they'd eaten a decent meal. I think they're hungry, I whispered in surprise. I don't care if they're hungry, said Mamma, although she was trembling with fear. They can pay for what they're taking like anyone else would. Every theft was a blow to our community, but nobody came out to confront the soldiers. Instead, we watched silently from our windows. Yes, but like Julia pointed out, they still have guns on them, said Paula. We'd rather go hungry than be shot or have our daughters raped, said Norna grimly. Other soldiers followed his lead and the chickens were taken from their coops along with the eggs and our milking cow. Not Bella, cried Mamma. We've had her for so long. She's part of the family. Shh, it's all right, I whispered. Paula can find us another milking cow, can't you? You know I will, she said confidently but I wondered how scarce livestock was going to be if Germans were scouring the countryside like this. Where do you think they're going? asked Mamma, peering through the window. Away from here, hissed Nonna. I think they're headed to Redjol and the West Coast to stop the Allies when they crossed the mainland, I said. But maybe they got separated from the rest of their unit, got lost in the mountains and ended up here. Suddenly, one of the men kicked in a door across the street and four men followed him inside. Oh dear, said Mamma, her eyes wide with shock. We could only watch, helpless, not knowing what was happening inside the house of our neighbour, Signora Romeo. At least there were no young men or women there, just a wizened old lady. The door opened and the men walked out again with bottles of olive oil, jars of olives, wheels of cheese and strings of dried mushrooms. We have to do something, said Paola. If they raid every home like this, we'll have nothing left and we'll all starve. But whatever else she was going to say was cut off by the little old lady stepping outside of her door and waving the men goodbye. She's done it to save the rest of us, said Mamma slowly, moving her hands in the sign of the cross as the men disappeared down the street, carrying their fines and leaving their stolen animals to the other side of the town without touching another home. Thank God for Signora Romeo, said Nonna. What about our sheep, said Paola in consternation. Surely they have enough now. I guess we'll have to wait and see, I said. It could have been so much worse, said Mamma, mopping her brow with a handkerchief. After a while, when we'd seen no more soldiers, we felt game enough to go out onto the street. Signora Romeo greeted us. I have to thank you, she said as she shuffled towards us. Without your warning, I would have had my best products out for them to find. Whatever happened? said asked Mamma. One spoke a little Italian and somehow I managed to get him to believe that all my, that my preserves and oil are the best in the village and everyone else is poor quality. Why would they believe that? Paola asked. Because I told him I'm a strega and that I cursed everyone's olive oil this year so mine would be the best. Then I waved around an old amulet I had and mumbled some words in front of them, telling them that bad things would happen to them if they took any more from the village. She shrugged. I thought it was best they were just gone. Asking them to put anything back was asking for trouble. I told them they could stay a little longer that I'd enjoy the company of young men like themselves, but unfortunately they decided to leave. She began to cackle uproariously, slapping her hand against her black skirt. Mama grasped her by the shoulders and kissed her downy cheeks. You could have been killed, but you saved the village. You saved us all. It was nothing, she said, but she beamed with pleasure. There we are. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so, you much, so for much for sharing, sharing that, Tanya. Um, I'm, 
I just think that was a, a such a great uh, excerpt of the of the book and uh, such a strong, you know, story moment as well um, of the anticipation of what's happening and everything. Uh, was that story was that drawn from uh, a story of your grandparents? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it took a while to get the information out of my father. I think my grandmother had told him stories just, you know, when he was younger. He probably didn't take a lot of notice of them, as young people often don't. And it wasn't until I actually started to really dig into his memories of his of his mother and um, her stories about the war, anything that she could relate to him, that he said, oh, actually, she did tell me about this story of when the Nazis, the Germans actually came to the village. I said, oh, so they actually were there because they were very remote. And um, most of the the battles and the Allied and the German soldiers were actually um, more towards the actual um, west coast of Calabria and they are on the eastern coast. So th these men were most obviously lost and in the mountains, somehow took a wrong turn. So yes, she, she, um, she had told him how how they had come to the village and they were desperate and hungry and and uh, just looking for food. They didn't cause them any trouble um, and they took food and then they left again. And that was their only ever contact with the Nazi soldiers, which was um, which was pretty amazing. Yeah. So I really I had to I had to pop that in there. Yeah, it's incredible the way you can um, sort of weave those personal and family stories in. Um, how did your family react the first time you told them that you wanted to write a book based on the history? Um, well, with Echoes of War, I suppose, um, my dad's dad's family were, were you know, quite surprised but, but really pleased. They already knew that I'd written a few stories about my mum's side of the family, the German side of the family. So um, I, I guess they must have assumed that this was going to happen at some point soon. Um, so look, they, they were really pleased. Um, my dad and my aunt um, were the best ones to actually talk to about the various stories. And yeah. as I mentioned in the talk, they'd been to Italy the year before. Um, I should have gone with them that time. But um, anyway, so they, they had lots of really good information for me and were only, especially my aunt, only too happy to sit down and, and talk, me, talk to me about the various memories of growing up and, and the different stories of her parents. Um, luckily for me, she'd already read my first three books, so um, she was really excited about um, what Echoes of War might look like. And in fact, yeah. yesterday she just gave me a call um, and said, I finally finished your book and I really loved it. And I said, oh, that's that's fantastic. That means so much to me. And I said, was it authentic? Did you find it authentic? And she said, yep, you didn't miss a beat. Everything in it that should have been in it was there. And I said, did you find the family stories okay in it? She goes, loved it. It just made it perfect. And I could visualise myself being back there again. And and I, I, that meant so much to me. Yeah, that's wonderful to sort of hear that feedback from the family. I've actually just got chills from that a little bit. Yeah, it was great. Uh, were there any of the stories, um, like the family stories, that didn't make it into the novel that you sort of like wanted to find a place for but couldn't uh, quite? Oh yeah i think i pretty well um added most of them in um the story about the the boy with the burns um yep. that that was um that was a story really close to my heart um it nearly didn't make it into the story um we were trying to find a place for it in the novel um because it was actually the manuscript ended up being quite long and needed a little bit of cutting and refining and that story nearly went, but um, I we were really lucky to find a place for that story. Um, and I was really, really intrigued to learn about um, the folk medicine at the time and and how they, how the different um, remedies um, were used in dealing with um, these kind of home accidents. Um, and in fact, this little boy was actually then treated by the doctor. But in Echoes of War, we've got Julia, who's now become a healer. Um, and a folk, folk healer and herbalist um, coming to treat the boy with different herbs and, and remedies. And he had actually been uh, treated with um, ink. And, and, and in, in the actual uh, family story, um, the doctor had come in and, and every, his shirt had stuck to his, to his skin. And when he took it off, it took that top layer of skin away, which is yeah. why he was left with um, terrible scars. 
Um, so yeah, it was really interesting just to sort of um, look at the other side of it. How would how would have a folk healer have treated this or a herbalist compared to perhaps a um, a modern doctor? So it was a real um, sort of uh, looking at the ancient um, traditional way of doing things and how the modern world had entered um, Italy sort of with World War II and yeah. the modern medicine had come into play. Of course, then after the war you had um, the medicines and antibiotics and like penicillin had come into play and that was really efficient too. So it was almost like an end of an era, I guess, um, during those war years with the, with the folk, folk healing. Yeah, yeah, that's really the point when... It sort of shifted from that traditional lifestyle to, yeah, everything kind of changed. Yeah, it really changed, especially with the Americans coming in and those yeah. real modern ideas and modern modern ways of doing things came into play. Yeah. Another story, actually, I, I wanted to touch, in, touch on, which I didn't get round to, um, my aunt told me a story that her father had said. So he, um, as I said, went to um, Ethiopia, Albania, um, in 1935 to the war there and also um, fought in Albania in 1939 and so when he came home my aunt remembered him telling them this story about this um, Albanian lady um, so there was they, they were soldiers the Italian soldiers they had won and invaded and won the war against Albania and this um, Albanian lady had been sent from the village to the soldiers on this mule she was all covered up um, so they actually couldn't see her um, she was veiled and they were told that she was the beauty of the village and that she was sent as a gift to the soldiers to, you know, please be good to us, be kind to us. Um, so she came across and then you know, the men were very excited because they hadn't seen a woman in a very long time. They'd been fighting in this war and then they, um, they unveiled her and um, she was this really old lady um, who was, you know, sort of lots of creases in her face. She was toothless and um, and the, the men were, you know, absolutely horrified. Um, so obviously this old lady went back to her village and I found it a really fascinating story that um, my grandfather had found it a bit of a funny story, but to me it was really poignant about what women would do during the war to survive and what the community would do to, yeah, to survive to protect as each well. other and yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah kind of gave me goosebumps when my aunt told me this story it's had this real double meaning i suppose this double layer yeah mm. did anything else um like when you're doing because obviously there's a lot of research like you spoke about went into it yeah um to make you know you're in a different country or in a different time period um to make that so compelling and believable do anything like really jump out at you as being just like surprising, like really unexpected? Um, I suppose um, I was really, I was really um, interested to learn more about um, the whole, all of Mussolini's regime, I suppose. I'd, I'd done yeah. so much research about um, Hitler and the Nazis and the German side of the war that to discover um, how, how people viewed Mussolini um, leading up to World War II, um, a lot of a lot of people thought that he had done great things because he'd improved the the economy of the region. Um, he was trying to make Italy a proud nation once again, and he was trying yeah. to you know, colonize. There were all of these really interesting um, opinions um, of what people thought of him. But then, of course, once World War Two hit, um, they, you know, they nobody really wanted to be involved in this war. That was wasn't Italy's war. Um, yeah. So I really was quite intrigued by the the perceptions and the attitudes of Italians to World War II. Um, they didn't really want to have a part of it. And yeah. um, a lot of the men just came home after um, after Mussolini was, was sacked and, and um, the Allies had come in and um, Italy had surrendered to the Allies. Um, men just, just went home even though they weren't supposed to. They just you know, got their kit and off they went walking home um, even though they weren't officially disbanded. So it was it was interesting yeah. to learn, yeah, just a very, very different way of, of how they reacted um, compared to, say, the German soldiers who were very, very proud of their, their country and proud of their yeah. war. And, um, yeah, so it was a real, real difference between um, researching both countries in, in both sets of books. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I suppose the sort of common perception is that, you know, the 
the, the, these like the sort of enemies of yeah. you know of the allies in world war ii like there's this sort of idea that they would all be so similar and so yeah. the same yeah that's right. to actually look at it and break it apart and to get these perceptions of you know like no one really says good things about Mussolini anymore you know no. but of course you know he had to come to power somehow that's yeah. right yeah and he was actually in power quite a long time I know he was a dictator but I think the fascists and Mussolini came to power in like 1924 or something so quite yeah, a long so he time he was around for a while yeah, yeah. Before Hitler um yes and, and I really found it really interesting too learning about how um Mussolini had this real relationship with the Catholic Church and the Vatican, um, how he realised that it was an important instrument in keeping the Italian people together and behind him. So he needed to use the church as a vehicle to, you know, put out his policies and, and his form of government. But, of course, there was a, a lot of friction leading up to World War II with his relationship with Hitler. Whereas, of course, in Germany, um, religion was, you know, not on the table really at all. Um, so there was that real interesting difference too, that they were really quite different um, countries. Yeah, because um, so your first three books were about sort of the more German side yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, so the first novel, The Girl from Munich, so that uh, only came out in 2018. Yeah, so 20, sort of yeah, 2017, four, I think, yeah. Yeah, so, so sort of uh, like 2017 till now, you've got four books. Like, that's a heck of a pace to keep up. <laughs> Like how um what what kind of motivates you to 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 keep writing and to you know do you, do you get writer's block or anything or yeah 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 <laughs> look I do get writer's block I guess um with my grandmother's story which was the girl from Munich that was about her growing up during um, World War Two in Germany she had passed away um, in 2015 and that's when we found her her box of treasures you know photos yeah. and mementos. So that was that was you know very motivating in itself to start writing that story. So that that was fairly fairly easy and straightforward. Um, the girl from uh, the suitcase of dreams that followed afterwards was about her migrating to Australia. So out of that box of treasures was stuff about from when she was a girl in Germany to sort of her life here in Australia. So it kind of followed on fairly easily. And I was able to use a lot of my own memories and my mum and dad and and their friends growing up here in Australia. Um, so that wasn't too bad either. I didn't really have a lot of writer's block with that one. Letters from Berlin was a little bit different because it was based on my grandmother's uh, cousin's story. Yeah. And um, I was really lucky that I had a lot of information about his story from newspaper articles in Germany because he had been involved in a landmark case um, to try and claim his family property back, which was um, uh, taken after or taken at the end of the war and was expropriated. Um, so I was lucky to have his story, but I didn't have that real personal connection and those real personal stories. Um, so that was a little bit harder, but it also allowed me to throw another element of fiction into the story as well. So I guess it was a little bit more tricky just blending um, the actual the authenticity of the family story with, with a fictional storyline to really enhance the story that was there. Um, but with, I suppose with Echoes of War, um, I wanted to look at my dad's family story as well because all of his family members are getting older and I wanted to be able to um, get their stories before they got to the stage where they didn't remember or, or yeah. didn't want to talk about it anymore. And certainly that was the case with my German grandmother too, that, you know, as they got older, they didn't really want to talk anymore about, about what their life had been like when they were younger or they'd forgotten parts of the story so I guess that's the thing that motivates me the most now is to get these family stories um, before that next generation forgets them or doesn't want to talk about them or they pass away. So, in fact, at the moment I'm writing um, my husband's uh, father's story, his his family story, um, before he gets to that point as well. So they're all really yeah. great motivating factors. Um, but, yeah, I certainly do get writer's block too, I have to say. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time this evening, Tanya. Um, so Echoes of War, it's out now. We've got eight copies at Wollongong City Libraries. Um, they are being taken out very regularly. So if anyone's interested in checking them out, make sure you get your reservations in quickly. Um, otherwise, buy your own copy. Why not? 
Um, and we've got uh, the ebook available as well on BorrowBox. Uh, you can access those resources through our website at wollongong.nsw.gov.au slash library. Um, and yeah, just thank you again, Tanya, for a wonderful evening. Well, thank you so very much for having me. I really enjoyed chatting to you about Echoes of War and um, it, was, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much, everyone, for, uh, for watching and tuning in and have a great night. <laughs>